What is programmable photonics? Well, I guess that's what you're here to uh, what, uh, what you're here to learn from me. But before we dive into that, let me give you just a two minutes quick gist of uh, the whole context of this uh, presentation or this course, which is the Photon Hub Europe project. Um, Photon Hub Europe is a very large innovation hub for Europe focused on photonics with the idea of uh, basically bridging the valley of death, as they call it, uh, to get research, photonics research, exciting photonic innovation to commercial reality. So supporting the, the, the European ecosystem uh, to realize photonic uh, innovation. It's a, a fairly large European project and it's based around a 15 member state network of about 500 experts trying to get that expertise, a lot of that is in, in academia, to get that expertise mobilized to support uh, SMEs, to support companies who want to innovate based on photonics. Uh, so the idea is that photonics, Photon Hub Europe is not looking at the very basic ideas. It's not looking at the, 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 the massive large volume manufacturing, but it's that gap in between the difficult part where you have to translate that idea into something realistic. And as such, it wants, the project wants to present itself as a one-stop shop for photonics innovation. So not just the technology part, but also the business coaching, investment coaching. Uh, there's, there's not just a global European ecosystem, there's also local regional uh, actors that, that, that really try to uh, make a difference where it matters. And a, part, a big part of uh, this whole effort is, of course, training and reskilling. And this course fits in that uh, that topic or that field in the sense that we're trying to bring some of the new concepts of photonics to a broader audience. Um, okay, that being said, enough about Photon Hub Europe. Let's dive into the topic of today, programmable photonics. Um, first of all, why am I here talking about programmable photonics? So what are my credentials? Well, I'm from Ghent University and IMEC. Um, part of the photonics research group, which is as academic research groups go, is quite big. You can see here our entire group, 12 professors, in total more than 100 people. Um, we were quite, we're, we're quite successful in our field. Uh, we've, we've collected over the years uh, seven grants from the European Research Council. We, we've spun off seven, seven companies as of recent. Um, and we focus mostly on photonic systems on a chip. So we try to build optical, optical systems, but reduce them to chip size, mostly using silicon technology. And my personal research topic inside this larger group is to look at large scale photonic circuits and programmable photo photonic circuits is just one particular class uh, where basically you, you use the techniques from you combine techniques from photonics, electronics, and software to make very very flexible photonic system. So that brings me to the the topic of today: for programmable photonics. Well, there's there's two keywords here. On one hand, there's programmable, and there's photonics. So let's let's look with the the more known uh, topic here: programmable. I mean, if we think about programmable systems, we think about systems which run on software. So their function is not just defined by the hardware but it's also defined by the software layer, which runs on top of that. That makes, of course, there's the system quite flexible. Um, on, it also makes it upgradable and multifunctional. So we're kind of used to this kind of system. If you have a smartphone, it's over, it, it gets upgrades on a regular basis. It can do many different things. So a, a, a synonym that we, talk, that we typically use for programmable is smart. So like indeed a smartphone. Compared to a hardware phone that, that we knew from the old days, a smartphone can do a lot more things. It's really a multifunctional device. A smart TV gives you access to a lot more content. A smart home makes it possible to rewire the functionality in your home to, to make it responsive to certain events in a way that you can't do if you just use candles for lighting. We also now see the whole thing about smart systems get into the automotive industry like new cars electric cars uh, 
Teslas, for instance, they get over-the-air upgrades. So the functionality of the car improves over time rather than degrades over time. And more towards our own fields, we, st we start seeing that in networks as well. Networks are no longer fixed hardware connections. It's essentially just defined by a software layer on top that determines which computers can see each other and which computers should be screened or protected by firewall. So programmable photonics basically takes these concepts of smart and flexible systems, upgradable systems. Uh, so taking systems that you can manipulate in software, but of course adding the photonics where we want to manipulate light and preferably light on a very small scale, scale of the wavelength. So we combine these two together, we get systems that we can manipulate in software on a small scale. Now, you can ask yourself why we want to do such a, such a manipulation. Well, because light is a very important carrier of, of information and we want to process that information. We want to do something with it. Now, we're all familiar with beams of light, uh, laser, laser beams. Um, they contain actually quite a lot of information. I mean, you have, if you just look at a certain point in time, the power in the laser beam is something that you can encode information on. You can switch the laser beam on and off. Uh, but your, a beam also has an intensity profile. A beam also has a phase profile because light is actually a wave, as we will see. A uh, laser beam has a wavelength. If you can change the wavelength or combine wavelengths, you have additional information. And then on top of that, you have polarization because your light is an electromagnetic wave. It has an electric field and a magnetic field. And so as it propagates, you basically can switch or can modulate those fields. You can modulate information in there. Uh, another way of looking at light, if you, if, you want to be, uh, if, if you want to be detailed, you can also look at light as a flux of photons. And especially if you start thinking in the quantum applications, this is a better way to look at light. Now, what do we do with light and where can photonics play a role? I think this is quite important to realize that photonics is already around us in our daily lives. Uh, maybe not in the way that we're going to discuss here, not programmable photonics, but it is already there. This place contain quite a lot of photonics. I mean, essentially, they're, they're, they're projecting light onto your face. Uh, CDs and DVDs, they might sound a bit outdated, but they're really like impressive demonstrations of what you can do with light uh, and, and how, you can, how far you can push light for information storage. Spectroscopy for all kinds of applications, medical, astronomy, uh, science, etc. Su uh, agriculture, super useful, uses photonics at its core. And of course, probably one of the biggest areas of where photonics is today is optical communication. I mean, this is, this is really a very important field because the whole internet runs on optical fiber communication. Every data center today runs on optical fiber communication. So you can't just rule out photonics uh, as a technology. And the same is something that we now start to see emerging. Light is a very good medium for sensing. So photonics, light on a miniature scale, is becoming more and more important for sensing. Now, probably the the biggest question open today, is photonics useful for computing? Every, every so often, and more and more these days, you see messages or news items that say that, okay, people are using photonics for computing. And we'll come back to that in, in, uh, later in this presentation, how photonics might effectively be used for computing. But in itself, today, if we look at the practical applications for photonics and computing, it's mostly in a supporting role like the optical fiber links that connect all the parts of a digital electronic computer together for very high speed communications. And the reason that photonics at this point is mostly used in this context is that pho photons are not really good at doing the kind of computations that we are used to from electronic electronics. So binary logic requires typically very strong interactions and very strong nonlinearities. And photonics is not really, really good at it. Photons are just not, not suitable for that. But on the other hand, photons can be used for information processing because as we will see, they turn out to be really good at certain linear analog operations. Well, just let, let's have a look at what 
type of information processing you can do with light because it's, it's, it's very relevant to the topic of programmable photonics today. And we start with something that doesn't look like programmable photonics at all. Just a simple beam of light. If you, make a, if you have a beam of light propagating and you make a cross-section of it, you get a certain field profile. You have the electric and the magnetic field with a certain intensity and phase profile. Now, it turns out that as this beam of light propagates, it's in real time, it is solving the following differential equation. So your beam of light propagates, its field profile will change. And the change in this field profile is according to this differential equation. So if you're in a situation that accidentally you need to solve this differential equation, this beam of light does that for you at the speed of light as it's propagating through the air. Of course, this is a, a quite limited proposition because, yeah, it only works if you want to solve this particular differential equation. But no worries, it can do more. For instance, if you put something in the path of that beam of light, the differential equations change. And you can do very, very interesting stuff. For instance, a lens, a very simple lens, like the one you use in your glasses, if you put a beam of light, if you see the profile of the beam of light between the two focal planes of the lens on either side of the lens, you will find out that it's basically a Fourier transform. And a Fourier transform is a very useful, um, a very useful mathematical function. It's used a lot in signal processing. So here you have a system which has no moving components, which does not consume power except for the, the light source that performs in real time a Fourier transform. Now this, this starts to become useful. Of course, you can cascade these systems and you can, uh, you, can, you can do more. So if you want to grow these systems, you have to start putting more and more optical elements on the table and it eventually it becomes quite coarse and quite, quite a lot of, uh, quite complex. And ideally, you don't want to do more than a Fourier transform, you want to do generic computation. So you need a way to basically translate or, or translate computational operations into such a system of light. And one way to do it is to start using pixels, picture elements, like you discretize a beam of light, you no longer have a continuous beam of light. At a certain plane, you for instance, have a pixelated image. And at the output plane, you have a detector, which also detects pixels. And okay, these components already exist. You have, for instance, what we call a spatial light modulator. It's a device that is quite often used in, uh, in, in projectors, like beamers, as we know them, uh, to project an image on a far surface. And as you know, that image can be encoded in intensity, but there's also spatial light modulators that can encode the face. So you can put a 2D array of information and you can encode it in a beam of light. And a detector, a photo detector or a camera image, we also know it also can detect pixels. So th these, are, these are kind of really, really useful components if you want to do some optical information processing. Okay, so let's, sorry, my, my system was frozen. Um, so let, let's, see what, let's see what we can do with such spatial light modulators and some lenses. And it turns out that if you take a spatial light modulator here to project an input image, you send that through a lens, which will perform a Fourier transform for you. And then you have a second spatial light modulator, which contains a kernel like a kind of a, an encoded image that you want to detect in the input image, a certain pattern that you want to detect. You now multiply the Fourier transform of that input light with that kernel, and then you send it again through a lens with another Fourier transform. What you will find is that now in the output plane, you will get very bright spots in the area where the pattern that you want to recognize is present in the input image. So you have a real-time pattern recognition system here that can filter out specific items from an input image. This is called a convolution processor or a 4F system. The, the, the concept of this has already been known for, for tens of years, but it's really now coming to an age where it can be useful. And for instance, the company Optalysis has this kind of convolution processor. They, they, they 
uh, made that. This is already a demonstration from a couple of years ago, where, where you, you have a full accelerator that performs this kind of operations in real time. And it can be plugged into a computer like an accelerator card. You, you see it's quite heavy. So you might, because it has a full lens system in there, fold it into uh, multiple beam paths. But it can do 2,400 convolutions in real time on 3 megapixel images. This is an expensive operation that is now accelerated using an optical system. And you can do similar things. You can, for instance, uh, bounce light back and forth between the spatial light modulator. So have multiple planes that, that can perform operations. Uh, so that, and this is an example from Queensland University and uh, Bell Labs in, uh, in the US, where they take a mixed beam coming out of a multi-mode fiber and they separate it into all the individual modes. Uh, so you can encode information on every mode of the multi-mode fiber by entangling or disentangling these beams using this uh, spatial light modulator here, where the light, the light is basically bouncing off it, that light modulator multiple times. So the interesting thing is that this, all of these things that I've shown up till now are what we call linear operations. They're essentially uh, just solving linear integrals. If you generalize that, you, 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 you can imagine that if you have a set of input pixels and a set of output pixels, you can build an optical system that performs any linear mapping, so any linear combination between the input image and the output image, which corresponds to a matrix vector multiplication. So, and this becomes interesting because this is a type of operation that's used a lot in pattern recognition in machine learning and in signal processing and even in quantum operations. So if you can do that in real time by just propagating light through a system and, and okay, the system should be generic enough that it can construct any matrix here then you can do real-time optical computing. Not general purpose computing, but this particular very expensive mathematical operation can be done with a limited amount of power consumption. And a first proposition of how such a system, like the block in the middle, how it could look like, was already proposed in the 90s. Basically, it, you can build such a block, such a generic matrix, just with two, two types of building blocks. You need a phase shifter, something that can be electric, can electrically be controlled to delay the optical phase. And you need a beam splitter where you can tune the splitting ratio between the two beams coming out, so the coupling ratio. And if you arrange it in this kind of triangular uh, matrix, you can construct any unitary matrix between a set of input beams and a set of output beams. And okay, there's a still a discrepancy here because this is just looking from the top. It's a 1D system. You have a 1D, set, a 1D array of pixels here and a 1D array of pixels here. While what I'm showing at the top right is a 2D array of pixels and a 2, a and 2D array of pixels going out. But most of, the, most of the work today on programmable photonics is focusing on systems like this where you have a 1D array of pixels. And one example which we can really call a hero experiment, uh, is from a, a couple of years ago from a Chinese group that built a system with a hundred mode interferometric structure. So that's, that's really a very, very complicated system. And it required a lot of alignment to, to build such a system on an optical table. So optical tables are probably not the best way to go. I mean, it's okay, you start with this, you start with the system I showed on the previous slide. And at some point you run into this problem that there's just no more room on your table. And this is also not the type of system that eventually will end up inside a smartphone. We need something more compact. And the obvious answer is, same as we use in electronics, let's bring this kind of system to a chip, to the surface of a chip. Let's take chip technology, which for electronics has already demonstrated that it allows you to make much more complex systems with billions of transistors. You, you gain in performance, you gain in reliability, you can get lower and lower power consumption. And eventually, these electronic chips today are dirt cheap, at least some of them, the ones that go in your dishwasher. Uh, 
the one that go in your supercomputer are probably still expensive. But we can do the same with photonics. So we, we try to bring photonic systems to a chip. And what a basic photonic integrated circuit would look like is something like this, where you have light sources, electrical modulation of optical signals, you have wavelength filtering to separate the different colors in your in your wavelength. You have photodetectors to combine uh, to convert optical signals back into the electrical domain. Uh, and of course, you need some interfaces to the outside world, which for optics is typically an optical fiber. So combining all these elements on the chip together, all these different essential functions that you need for generating light, transporting light, filtering light, modulating light and detecting of light, of light is what we call photonic integrated circuits. And all these building blocks we then connect together with optical wires we call waveguides. Now, just like in electronics, photonic integrated circuits has been around for some time. It's not yet as mature, but we have seen a similar evolution where we started from with electronics from single transistors to integrated circuits to systems that now have a billion of transistors. In photonics, we started with laser diodes and optical fibers then started to make very basic optical waveguides on a chip. But now, we, with the introduction of the technology called silicon photonics, we're really getting to a technology where you can do thousands or ten thousands of optical elements on a chip. And the reason you can do that in silicon photonics is that unlike transistors, which have a very clear scaling law that makes them smaller and smaller, in photonics you cannot just scale waveguides. You can only scale waveguides if you have materials with a very high refractive index contrast. And it turns out that if you take a waveguide core of silicon and surround it by a cladding of silicon dioxide, you get that very high refractive index contrast. And so this is, this is, this is a game changer, or has been a game changer. Instead of having waveguides the size of an optical fiber, which is 10 micrometer core, it's small, but it's from the point of view of a chip, it's already quite large. You can now go to 3-5 semiconductors, which gives you waveguides that are a few micrometer across, or silicon wires, which are only half a micrometer, so 500 nanometers in size. Going from here to here gives you about 10,000 times increase of the number of components that you can put on a chip. And that allows you to make really complex circuitry. And so the reason that people love silicon photonics today is exactly because you can make these high density circuits. But there's a second reason why silicon photonics is, in, is, is popular is that it uses silicon, which is the same material as used for making electronics. So the, the, the mental click that was made a couple of decades ago was if you can make photonics in the same manufacturing infrastructure of, as electronics, you have a massive benefit of scale because you can make really complex functions at potentially a low cost in high volume. So silicon photonics put, is, is just one technology to put many optical components on the surface of a chip, but compared to most of its competitors, it has an enormous scale advantage. On one hand, you have a large scale manufacturing infrastructure already there. People have already built those fabs to make electronics. We just have to put some developments in there to just migrate it to photonics. But at the same time, you have these very tiny waveguides, this very high index contrast that gives you large scale integration. You can make complex circuitry. So just to put it again on a scale, if you take glass waveguides with a low index contrast and you translate that functionality to silicon, you gain, thanks to the index contrast, about a factor of 10,000 in, uh, in, in use of footprint. So that means that you can put make circuits that are 10,000 times more complex. The micro, micrometer scale building blocks on centimeter scale chips can eventually give you thousands or millions of components on a chip. And this scaling very much resembles Moore's law. So if you, if you just plot over time the complexity of silicon photonics and other technologies uh, on, uh, as a function of number of components that are used on a single chip, then you see that we are slowly approaching the 1 million mark, which is close to the density that, that, that you can get with a, with a silicon photonics chip. So this is cool. It's, we basically see a similar drive as we see in electronics in making systems more complex, more powerful. 
Of course, if you just count the number of components, we're lagging about yeah, three to four decades. And not just in the density of components, but also in the maturity of how we can make our uh, photonic chips work. And I'm coming back to, to that a bit later because it's a key rationale in the whole field of programmable photonics. Is, the, uh, is that 30, 40 years lag that we have, how, do, how can we close this gap? Now, the second aspect I mentioned on scaling was the large scale manufacturing. Well, what we've seen over the past years is that silicon photonics has emerged from research to today, mostly products in the transceiver space. So we've also, but we've seen the emergence of industrial foundries that allow you to make those transceivers in large volumes. Uh, but what we expect, if we look at the research that was already done in the early 2000s, what we can expect is that, that the, the whole field is going to explode into a much wider range of applications. And that's needed because we need more chips to actually make this a, vi a viable field. Where today we are talking about millions of silicon photonics chips being fabricated. That's actually not a lot, as we will see in a minute. We need to go to billions of chips uh, to, to, to really make it an impactful technology. And OK, there's always market reports that, pro that predict that, yes, we will get that massive growth in, in photonic applications. We will, we will see photonics grow way beyond what it is today. But there's a number of questions that need to be asked. Because today you see that all of it, almost the entire market is in data center transceivers. And the prediction is that the market will diversify a lot into a lot of different applications, for instance, like consumer health. How does that happen? Well, there's a bit of a bottleneck here. And again, I will come to that, uh, or, or, or you will see how that relates to programmable photonics. One of the bottlenecks is that today, we're actually working at very, very low volumes. And that's for the electronics industry or for the semiconductor industry, low volumes is actually not a very attractive proposition. We do have lots of transceivers today, but let's put that in perspective. Let's take a 200 millimeter foundry where they make photonic chips or they make electronic chips. And let's assume that they make uh, about 36 million chips per month. How do we get to that calculation? Well, we make an assumption of how large is one photonic chip, how many chips can fit on a wafer, and what is the fab capacity of running wa wafers, which is for, as a typical example, for a somewhat older 200 millimeter fab, 60,000 wafers per month. Now let's put that in perspective. What is the market? If we can, if you have a fab that can make 36 million photonic chips per month, how does that match the market? Well, it turns out that the entire transceiver market for 2021 could be satisfied by this single fab in less than two weeks. So that means if you, if you build a fab that can make so many chips, or you have a fab that makes so many chips, it's going to run idle for most of the year. That's not a very valid business proposition. OK, but let's say we, we know that this field is growing very rapidly. So let's, let's take the projections for 2025, where we expect 500 million chips per year that need to be fabricated. That's more like it. I can fill my fab with that, except that there's more than one fab in the world. At this point, there are about 10 commercial industrial fabs that can make silicon photonics. So the total market for data centers at transceivers can never suffice to fill all these fabs. Luckily, these fabs are also producing electronics together with photonics. So it's not that like they're running idle. But still, it, it takes quite a lot of time and effort and money to keep a fully functional silicon photonics platform running in a fab, even if it's running only on partial capacity. Just to give it another, uh, another uh, perspective, 60,000 wafers would be about one month for a fab. That matches roughly all the wafers that silicon photonics has fabricated in the whole of 2021. So, and, and about half of that was for products. The other half was for developing and, and experiments and product development for other different things. Again, 
this is just the same message such volumes are way too low to be really sustainable to keep these fabs operational in the long term so we need something we need more applications beyond these transceivers beyond these data centers to really make use of this capacity that we've already built and okay then there's an obvious thing I mean, why would photonics only be useful for data centers? It's like saying that electronics is only useful for calculators. No, we know that electronics is useful for many, many other things. Basically, everything we buy today is, has an electronic chip in it, whether it needs it, really needs it or not. I mean, we just put a chip in it. So if we take the same reasoning, like what are we using optics for today? What are we using light for today? Well, it's also much more than optical communication. It's like I mentioned in the very beginning. It's sensing, it's medical diagnostics, data storage, displays, material processing, and even energy production like photovoltaics is also a form of photonics. And a lot of biology and biomedical uh, processes use optics. So the question is really, why are we not seeing these applications in photonic chips today? Well. I should have a caveat here. For more than 20, 30 years, people have been demonstrating applications like this in a photonic chip, in academia, or in research. But there's very, very few products that go beyond optical communication. There's very few products out there that already use photonic chips for these applications. And why is that? Well, it, this is my take on it. It takes a really long time to develop a photonic chip that is good enough for a commercial application. Why? Because, well, just making a photonic chip takes you a year. And with today's ecosystem of silicon photonics, the maturity of the photonics technology platform, the design tools, everything around the testing, packaging, it takes four to five years to get something that really works. And that's an expensive process because it's, it's, it's not just the cost of taping out a chip, which is like half a million to a million euros per tape out. It's a five year runway and most innovation, innovative startup companies don't have that time. So, and this is very much in line with the whole message of Photon Hub Europe. We need to close that gap. We know that there's fabrication technologies. We know there are lots of application ideas. We know that many concepts have been proven in R&D labs, but we need to shorten the timeline to take that from the lab into a product. <coughs> so, how do we do that? Well, we need fewer iterations, faster iterations, and we need rapid prototyping capabilities. And Fewer iterations and faster iterations means that photonics needs to become more and more like electronics, where you have first time right design and testing capabilities. If you design an electronics chip and you, you're a skilled designer, you know that it's going to work first time right. In photonics, that's not the case. Like I mentioned, you typically today need four or five iterations to really get it right. But you need a second capability, and that's, that's, pro, that's rapid prototyping. And that's where programmable photonics comes in. And so it's a bit of a long-winded introduction, but I wanted to make sure that I sketched this field properly and that, that the, the rationale for the whole field of programmable photonics is quite clear. Let's, let's start with an example here. Let, let's, say, let's say that I want to build an optical transceiver for a data center link. Okay, like I mentioned, I have to design, fabricate, package, and test a chip. So I start by making a design. It's a transceiver design is actually can be quite simple. You need a set of modulators, you need the light coming in from a laser. You need to modulate that light and then you need to send it through fibers through your, your receiver. And we, in this case, we just modulate four different channels, each on an individual fiber called PSM4. Um, there's one person, I'll, I'll mute. Um, there's one person unmuted. So on the receiver side is even simpler. You just have a, uh, have a set of detectors, your fibers come in and your light goes to your detectors. But there's limitations to such a transceiver. So if, if, you, if you've designed this, this device, it's going to take a year, two years before you get it right. 
But in the meantime, communication ideas might change. What if you want to upgrade or change the design even before it's uh, before it's made or even after the first year? Well, you'd need to basically make a new transceiver. Let's say we want to go to a coherent transceiver. We use the same type of modulators and we combine the same detectors, but we just connect them in a different way in a circuit so that you have a coherent IQ modulator and that you have a coherent receiver with a 90 degree hybrid. It's essentially just the same building blocks, just connected in a different way. And if you want to do wavelength division multiplexing, again, you're using the same modulators. Now you use a filter bank to combine the modulated signals on different lasers. And you need another filter bank to unravel those four signals. But you use the same set of modulators and the same set of detectors. But every time you have to go through that whole process of design, fabrication, package testing, and all over again, and usually multiple times. So it would already make a big difference if you can reduce that to one or two iterations instead of four or five. It would make an even more or bigger difference if you can already validate your idea, your prototype, before having to tape out a dedicated chip without having to go through this one year loop. And the way people do that in digital electronics is using programmable devices like field programmable gate arrays. You basically have a set of generic building blocks on a chip with programmable wiring. So you can connect your system together like you want and you can test it in a matter of weeks, not in a matter of years or months, in a matter of weeks. You can just buy these chips off the shelf Start programming and you can validate whether your system works. And if you're a startup, you can show it to your investors, showing that your, uh, that your proposition works. You can try it out with select customers to check if your value proposition is, is really there. And only if really needed for performance or power consumption reasons, at that point, you will start designing an ASIC, an application specific chip. But you've managed to validate your whole concept before you needed to embark on a long journey of iterations of chips. And like I mentioned, with electronics, you pretty, can be pretty confident that your first version of your chip is going to be good or even or, or maybe almost good, but it's, it's not going to cost you more than two iterations. With photonics today, with the current state of design tools and testing capabilities and the ecosystem, it's going to take you four to five iterations. So we need this kind of tool as an innovation engine for photonics. An FPGA, or people call it photonic processors or uh, programmable photonics or universal photonic circuits. So programmable photonics. We need something like that. We need photonic integrated circuits that can be reconfigured in software to perform different functions. As a prototyping tool, as a, as a a volume tool or, or as a, a, an engine for innovators to create new applications for photonics. And it's necessary because the whole photonic ecosystem needs applications. It's, it's, it's a, it, it can collapse if we don't, if we don't come up with good volume for that, that warrants all this fab cap capacity. So how would such a chip look like? Well, it's nice to, Nice thing about PowerPoint is that you can just draw some rectangles and say that this is a chip. A photonic processor would essentially be a chip or a system of chips where you can have optical signals going in and out and your processor does some optical functions like modulation, filtering, detection, etc. In parallel, we also want the capability to have high frequency electrical signals going in and out or microwave signals going in and out. Why? Because Photonics, once you, once you can translate a microwave signal to the optical domain, you can do a lot of processing without certain limitations that you would have from high-speed electronics. Because photonics is operating at frequencies that are orders of magnitude higher than the microwave frequency. So you have the bandwidth there. Okay, let's look a bit closer how this looks. Our optical interfaces, yeah, that's optical fibers. But the, the high-speed electrical interfaces, the RF interfaces, these are essentially just modulators and detectors. If a high-speed signal comes in, the first thing you do is to just encode it onto an optical wave 
So you don't have all the problems with, with microwave connectors and the moment it's in the optical domain, it's a lot easier. You do all the processing in the optical domain. And then if you want to send it out again, you use a set of high speed photo detectors to send the microwave signals back out to the electrical domain. So you have now optical and electrical interfaces. You can even add some specialized optical blocks like amplifiers, like tunable resonators, etc. And everything is connected by this blue box in the middle, which I call a programmable all to all scatter matrix. It's essentially a box that allows you to take all light from any input and output and couple it in any arbitrarily linear combination with each other. Now we're back here to our linear combinations. Remember when we were talking about our free space information processing, we were also talking about linear combinations. Well, it's the same set of linear, same type of linear combinations. Only we now have waveguide ports and there's a piece of chip in the middle that we should be able to program so that any port can be coupled to any set of other ports any way we like. The nice thing is that this description is not just in amplitude, it's also in phase, so we need complex numbers here. It can be wavelength dependent, it can include reflection, so there's a lot of things that we, we really need to program here. Now, this is a quite complicated system to make. So let's simplify it a little bit and let's go to a system where instead of having all ports can couple to one another, we separate the ports in a set of inputs and a set of output ports. And now we, our programmable input to output scatter matrix becomes, let's say, an input to output transmission matrix. Light only flows in one direction. So we're not considering reflection anymore. We're still considering amplitude and phase. So the the, 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 the elements here of this matrix are complex numbers, but the light only flows from input to output. And we know such a system because we've already encountered that. It's essentially that proposition from the 90s by REC, which consisted of tunable phase shifters and tunable beam splitters. Now it turns out that you can make tunable phase shifters and tunable beam splitters on a chip. We just have to connect everything together with waveguides. Now the whole concept has been lying dormant for many, many years. It was revived by David Miller from Stanford in 2013 with guidelines on how you could implement the system of phase shifters and tunable couplers, how you could implement that on a chip. And essentially the, the key component is, you, is that you organize what we call optical gates in a mesh network like this. And an optical gate is a relatively simple device. It has two input ports, two output ports, and it allows you to couple the, uh, the, the power ratio, the splitting ratio of your light in an arbitrary way and the phase delay of the two outputs in an arbitrary way. The way to implement that on a chip is not as a PowerPoint rectangle, but is as a combination of tunable couplers and phase shifters. So you need control of the phase and you need control of the coupling. And it turns out that actually the most elegant way to do that on a chip is with just phase shifters. You make a Maxander interferometer with, with an equal path length, so a balanced Maxander interferometer. And then you have one phase shifter in the arm which controls whether in the top or bottom arm you get constructive or destructive interference. So it controls the coupling. You just need a second phase shifter in any one of these positions to also give you phase control. So you need a Maxander interferometer with two phase shifters. That's what you need. And with that, you can essentially make the same function as the one I show above, where you have control of the coupling and control of the phase. Now, this is an interesting tool because one of, one of these gates, you can quite easily control uh, how it operates by just controlling these phases. Now let's let's take an example of such a tunable two by two gate. And I've, I've made, I took the simplest abstract version, one with a phase shifter and a tunable coupler. Now the interesting thing is that with such a tunable gate, you can configure such a gate without having to do any direct computations. 
For instance, if I wanted, if I had some two beams of light coming in and I wanted to couple all the beams of light or all the light into the output, I can do that by adjusting the phases and the coupling in this tunable gate. And I can do it even automatically if I have a feedback loop with, for instance, a photo detector. So if I have a photo detector, I can read the power in the photo detector and I can tune that phase shifter to minimize the power going into my photo detector. And if, if the power in the top waveguide is minimized, that means it's becoming maximum in the bottom waveguide. And I can actually now use the same detector to guide, the, to control the tunable coupling here, to balance, to make sure that the two uh, contributions from the inputs cancel out exactly when they hit the photo detector. And because when the light cannot go anywhere else, it means it has to go into the output waveguide, number two. So without doing any computations, just doing a simple feedback loops, we, we managed to configure a device like this to program it that it couples the light from coming in from the two inputs into a single output. Now, if the intensity and the phase of these input waves changes, then this control loop can continue to adjust the phase shift and the coupling to maintain a maximum output in that bottom waveguide. And this is kind of cool. The nice thing is now that this is just a single gate, you can cascade these gates into larger circuits and do exactly the same thing. So you can use it to minimize, the, uh, to, to couple the light of multiple inputs into, for instance, output waveguide four by minimizing each detector one by one or even at the same time, canceling out all, the, all the, the beams of light in outputs one, two, and three. And as a result, what you end up with is all your light in output four. And this is without doing any specific calculations. Now this is only like a 1D array of these gates. If you want to do real uh, matrix vector processing, real, uh, full linear operations, you need more of these uh, gates. And in that case, it's best to have transparent detectors. And then you can, be, uh, you can add a second row and a third row of these gates. And OK, you can scale this up to multiple inputs. And, then you have the, and, and what you now have is this triangular mesh that was originally proposed consisting of tunable phase shifters and tunable couplers or beam splitters. Now, this is just one architecture, and it's the nicest one to explain. So uh, there, there's, there's other ways to implement such generic uh, linear operations. For instance, in th this was, a, this was an, uh, an architecture proposed by Clemens uh, so, uh, somewhat later in 2015, 2016, that can perform similar operations as the triangular uh, array, uh, the triangular lattice that was proposed by Reck and Miller. Now, first demonstrations of these devices were already uh, done in uh, like almost uh, 15 years ago. I think this is the very first one in the uh, glass technology. It's a fairly large chip. It's about this size. Uh, I believe you can still, if, you, if you're ever there, you can see it in the Science Museum in London. Um, it's, it's, a, it, well, it's a quite interesting exhibit. Um, the first demonstration in silicon was a bit later. This was done in our own lab. Um, and it, it has four inputs and four outputs where you can uh, indeed uh, take grating couplers. So you have fiber inputs, you have uh, power monitors uh, that, that allow you to, uh, to monitor the light inside the circuit. And indeed, you can perform this kind of feedback control that continuously updates the state of all the devices to make sure that your light ends up in the output that you want. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a powerful proposition. So we, we did the experiment where we're just beaming light onto the inputs and we're adjusting the inputs just uh, automatically by, uh, by, by changing the tuners and reading out the photo detectors. This is an example from 2017, uh, a much larger circuit, 26 inputs, 26 outputs. You see it has many more components. It needs all these massive amounts of wire bonds to, to control everything, uh, all uh, 170 70 phase shifters, but, but it works. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant, brilliant idea and it can implement these unitary matrix uh, operations. Now, why do we 
want this, well, what, what's the use of it? Well, I mean, like I already mentioned, with such, uh, such a, a circuit, if you represent the input amplitudes as a set of complex numbers and the output amplitudes of the light in each waveguide as a set of complex numbers, this block in the middle, this circuit in the middle, in real time performs a matrix vector multiplication, which is one of the key operations in many pattern recognition uh, systems, linear quantum optics, but also artificial neural networks. So there's a lot of interest today in using this kind of technology to make accelerators for machine learning, because a lot of the neuro, a lot of the operations in machine learning use this kind of operation. And in its basic form, it, it just performs a, a, it just performs a unitary uh, matrix multiplication, but there's quite convenient techniques that allow you to separate an arbitrary matrix into two unitary matrices and a linear matrix. So if you, with a, a, sm a small extension, you can make these circuits really like a full arbitrary matrix, mult matrix vector multiplier, which, as I mentioned, for a lot of machine learning uh, techniques is, is a very essential operation. So it's not surprising that we've seen most of the developments either in quantum photonics where you use these linear operations and you want to program them such as for instance this this very nice demonstration it's actually a commercial product by Quix uh, it's a 20 port fully programmable interferometers and it's it, it's really like it it has thousands of actuators it's a quite complex uh, system it's it's a, a rack mounted box uh, but inside at the core is a photonic chip that performs these matrix vector multiplications and other applications are machine learning so a, a lot of a lot of the, the drive for developing these circuits is based on mach is, is for machine learning and you might have heard of companies like light matter or light diligence for instance who have been building demonstrators for like real accelerator demonstrators based on this technology both companies or, or most companies actually have pivoted a bit away from uh, from this type of applications for the, the reason that it turns out to probably be a bit more complicated to really make it work as well as you want it to than it actually seemed to. And again, these companies have to go through these multiple iteration cycles to make many different photonic chips and also the accompanying electronic chips to really get to a product. So you need a long runway. And at the moment, they're, they're, they're focusing on slightly more accessible applications uh, in, the, in data center communications. So this is, uh, this, this is something that eventually you might want to use such a chip for. It's a demonstration by the Politecnico of Milano and Stanford, where they used a very simple matrix vector multiplication. It's only a four by four mesh, but they used it to implement a blockchain computation, so a hashing a hashing function for blockchain calculations. So you can you can imagine uh, if if you really want a, a useless application for photonics is that you get some uh, cryptocurrency powered by photonics. Um, now we have to be aware that these nice demonstrations uh, of these meshes, uh, including the the ones from these companies like Light Matter and Light Intelligence. They're programmable, they are programmable photonics, but this is not really the general purpose or the generic photonics that we wanted. Because all these chips were still made for one purpose. They're not the, 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 the general software configurable circuits that can be used for a lot of different things. No, they're programming, programmable, but they do not meet our requirement that we said earlier, that we need to have a multifunctional, multi-purpose chip that can be used to shorten innovation paths for developers. Now, one of the reasons why it's not generic enough is that this simplification that we proposed earlier, going to a transmission matrix instead of a scatter matrix, is probably too, constrict, uh, too restrictive. The fact that we separate our inputs and outputs in a, in a strict way, uh, but also the fact that most of these circuits are constructed to have balanced path lengths uh, 
so we cannot really make delays, makes it very difficult to implement in a circuit like that uh, optical feedback, wavelength filtering, and engineering of dispersion, which is where, which are things that most other photonic applications than, than communication and, and basic matrix vector multiplication, they need this kind of uh, capabilities. So why, if we, and if we would be able to enable this, we would be able to do time signal processing, like real-time signal processing on time signals. We would be able to perform integration and differentiation. Uh, we would be able to perform convolution processing. Essentially, we would have an, a programmable analog signal processor. So we need to step away from this, or it, this simplified architecture. We need to enable this all-to-all -all scatter matrix. How to do that? Well, it turns out that there are some architectures that allow you to do it. Instead of linking waveguides together in a one-way path, we can link waveguides together in loops. And at the core of these loops, we use the same type of gates that we used before. So now we can inject light and we can couple light between the loops. And that allows us to basically propagate the light through our mesh in any way we like. And the loops can be square loops. They can be hexagonal loops. You can see that the hexagonal loops are a bit more flexible because here a port is either an input or an output. In the hexagonal loops, you can use every port as either an input or an output. Now, the nice thing is that for these type of meshes, we use the same building blocks as we used for our forward only meshes or two by two optical gate that allows us to control the coupling and the phase delay. And if we do that properly, if we arrange these optical gates properly, we can now route light by just switching these optical gates from a bar state to a cross state. And we can route it any way we like. We can route it even back on itself in a, in a mirror. We can do that for multiple parts at the same time. So you're not limited to one function in your chip. You can do multiple functions if you have multiple beams of light. And the nice thing is that, that, that you can route light through the same copper and use the copper in a partial state to also split it. So you can do power distribution, you can do multicasting of signals. But the most interesting feature of such a mesh is now that if you have couplers in a partial state, you can not only use them as a splitter, you can also use them as a combiner. And what we have here now is what probably many of you know as a Maxander interferometer. You split your light on two parts and then you let it interfere again. And if you do that with a delay, then you get a wavelength dependent response. And this is interesting because this is essentially the most basic wavelength filter that we can build. And if we can combine multiple of those, we can construct arbitrary wavelength filters. And it's even better because we can also loop light in a ring. We can make a resonator which is also a very useful tool for making wavelength filters. So we can now combine Maxenders and rings and in different combinations to make wavelength filters. Now, the first demonstration of such a chip was done by the Polytechnical University of Valencia, but the group of Jose Capmani, uh, the key person, the, the key uh, researcher in this was Daniel Perez. And he made a programmable hexagonal photonic circuit with seven of these hexagons, seven of these unit cells, which is already, it's not a very large circuit, but it's already a, an impressive demonstration of integration. And it's already enough to really demonstrate what such a circuit can actually do. Because you can now route light through multiple paths in a circuit, which will give you a different delay. So you have a programmable time delay. It's, this, it's in discrete steps, but it's fully programmable within those discrete steps. So you can go, you can program it with like any combination of one or two delays in, in your mesh. You can do splitters with different delays. So you can have this kind of distribution tree where you have three different delays. So your light comes out with a fixed delay and you can do, you can program that in many different ways. So you, as, a, as a, a splitter tree or as a, as a, as a snake with, with tapping of light. And for each of these outputs, you can at the same time also control what their power is. So you have control of the power and the delay. 
You can actually also do matrix vector multiplication. You can configure such a recirculating mesh to have four inputs and four outputs and then propagate from left to right through this mesh, doing exactly the same function as we showed with these dedicated matrix vector multipliers. But the most interesting functions, as I mentioned, is filters. You can make cascade multiple mexenders together by just programming the states of the mesh and you can control all the parameters in that mexender. So you have control of the shape of the filter. You, you can control all the couplings and delays. And the same, this, this is just an alternative architecture. Again, you have three, three paths. Here you have three different paths. Here you have three different paths and you can, you can basically control the filter shape and uh, the bound pass of the filter. You can make ring resonators and again with full control over the, the, the loss in the ring and the phase in the ring. So you can shift the resonance and you can also tune the extinction ratio of the, re of the resonance and the Q factor. Now there are limitations of course. You cannot just make any mexender and any ring resonator. I mean if you, if you, make, if you make a mexender the number of delays that you can actually do is limited. Either it's a delay of two unit lengths, four unit lengths, six unit lengths. You cannot do a delay of five unit lengths in a mesh like this or of two and a half unit lengths. So you are limited in the specific free spectral ranges that you can actually implement. The same for the resonators. You can make a ring, the smallest ring you can make is six of these unit lengths. The next one is 10 and then you have 12, 14, etc. But you can't make a ring with three unit lengths, not without changing the, the, the configure or, or changing the, the design of the mesh or changing the chip itself. So the, the, the programmability is limited. Uh, it's, it's very flexible as long as you're sticking to the fixed delays, the fixed unit lengths that you actually uh, that you actually have on your chip. Now, this unit length imposes a constraint. Um, because the free spectral range, essentially the, the separation between two resonances or two filter peaks, is determined by this unit length. The longer this unit length, the longer this device, this gate, the, the, the narrower the bandwidth in which you can operate your, uh, your filter. And so if you want to make this device useful for very high frequency operations like 60 gigahertz microwaves or 140 gigahertz microwaves there are so you need to make these unit lengths as short as possible and that's a challenge because eventually that means you need a really really good gate it's not the only constraint we put on a gate your light passes through many gates so you want low optical loss you don't want 3 db of loss per gate otherwise after a few gates you have no light left. You want fractions of a dB of optical loss. You want low electrical power consumption. Um, because yeah, if you have hundreds of or thousands of these gates on a chip, you want them to be very efficient. You want to have them to give them a short optical length, as I explained before, because you want to make your filter delays as programmable as possible. So that means you need a very, very short gate. And preferably you want it also to be compact in footprint so you can cram many of these gates on a chip. You want them to be fast, megahertz, gigahertz configuration speed. Uh, preferably with a CMOS compatible drive voltage. Preferably in a way that there's no crosstalk, electrical or thermal crosstalk between gates so they're easy independently configurable. And of course, the gates are only one part of your circuit. You want everything to be compatible with all the other functions on your chip, like the fast modulation, the fast detectors, maybe the lasers, um, low loss waveguides, etc. You want all of that to be also part of your chip. And this is this may seem like a simple question: How do we make these gates? But today there is no real ideal technology, and I'm going to quickly run through you through couple of examples of technologies that are used today to make these gates to give you an idea of the, the research that is going on in this field just to, to realize this kind of requirements because at this moment there's no technology that takes all of these boxes at the same time so what do we have in our toolbox to make optical gates today well different physics mechanisms 
We have we can manipulate temperature, we can manipulate the carriers, electrical carriers, we can use electro-optic materials like liquid crystals, uh, we can use strain and stress, we can use mechanical movement. All of these effects have their strengths and weaknesses. Some of them are fast, some of them are strong. There's no real effects that are both fast and strong. So again, this is already an indicative point of a trade-off. Uh, you can either have a very strong effect which gives you a compact device or you can have a very fast effect which typically gives you a large device. Let's go through the key ones. Today the workhorse for making electro-optic phase shifters are heaters. Why? Because most materials have a thermo-optic effect and silicon actually has a quite strong thermo-optic effect which means if you change the temperature of the material it changes its refractive index, which will give you a, an optical phase delay. It's also very easy to implement a heater. You basically just take an electrical resistor, put it close to your waveguide, you run a current through it, it heats up the environment of the waveguide, and you get your phase shift. Of course, at the price of continuous power consumption and at the price of thermal crosstalk. So the whole performance of heaters depends entirely on how well you can manage the flux of heat in that device. If you can contain the heat very locally to the waveguide, you can make a very efficient heater with, with low crosstalk. But that means playing all these tricks like using these side trenches and undercuts to fully thermally insulate the heater. And yes, you get this kind of cool cross sections with very efficient uh, heaters, in, in this case half a milliwatt for a pi phase shift, that is very very low. But at the price of very complicated processing and also like having holes in your chip uh, might might be a reliability issue if, if you make this in large volumes and uh, if you have to run them for a long time. Uh, other examples, uh, one of the key tricks is indeed is with these holes is having an undercut that completely eliminates the leakage of heat to your substrate, your silicon substrate. But okay, you, you cannot fully eliminate the leakage of heat because your heaters need to be electrically connected. So that means there's metal wires coming very close to your heater. And then all these questions is like, if you do this undercut, it, can, you, can you still maintain a hermetic sealing of your chip? Can you eliminate mechanical stress that would eventually break how your chip is working? So yes, it works. People have made um, heaters with substrate undercut with good performance, fairly good efficiencies, good enough that you can actually run thousands of heaters on a chip and still manage the temperature on your chip quite well. But it's, it's, a question, it's questionable whether this in the long run is going to be the, the mechanism uh, that everyone is going to use, especially because there's an, another trade-off with heaters if you make them more efficient, you're also going to slow them down. So the, more, the most efficient heaters are actually also quite slow. Okay, what other mechanisms do we have? In the silicon photonics platform, we have, a, we have availability of carriers. I mean, these, these silicon waveguides are made with the same techniques as CMOS, elect, as CMOS electronics, so that means you can have dopant implantations, you can make junctions in your waveguide, uh, and as a result, if you have a junction in your waveguide, you can inject carriers, you can extract carriers, uh, and carriers start to interact with light. They give a bit of absorption loss, but they also induce a phase shift. So that means that if you, if you make a, a waveguide with a PN junction inside, and you manipulate the voltage over the junction, you can manipulate a phase shift in the waveguide. And this is actually a technique that's already been around for silicon photonics for the past 15, almost 20 years. It's the main technique to use to, uh, use to make modulators. Fast modulators that can encode an electrical signal onto an optical carrier. The problem is that even though this works well for modulators, it's not an ideal technology if you have to cascade tens or hundreds of these in series. Because these devices are quite lossy. The fact that there are carriers interacting with light gives you absorption loss. And they're also quite long. The typical length for one of these devices is a millimeter or two millimeters. So that means that you have long lossy devices 
by definition, this is almost impossible to, to, to cascade. The advantage is that they're fast, but they're limited in cascadability. So carriers, even though this technology is already available into the platforms, it's not a very good candidate for what we need to make a gate. Okay, what else do we have? Well, we can play with stress. This is, this is just an example from, from MIT. Uh, if you strain a silicon or a silicon nitride waveguide, it's refractive index changes. But it is a weak effect. It's a very, it's a, it's a nice effect. It doesn't introduce extra losses. Uh, it's a nice effect that it's, uh, it's controlled electrostatically, so it doesn't consume power, but it's a very weak effect. So that means that you need very long devices to make it work. So this is okay if you use a mesh where all the parts of the light are balanced, like in these four propagating meshes. It's really not ideal if you want to make it in a recirculating mesh where you want to make filters. So these nice demonstrations of these programmable waveguide meshes that have been done with piezo demonstrators, uh, piezo actuators, the actuators are millimeters long and again, too weak to use. So not a good candidate, not for what we are looking for. What else do we have? <coughs> well, Silicon might not be a good material with a good electro-optic effect, but there are materials that have a, a quite good, strong electro-optic effect, uh, at least relatively strong. It's called the Pockels effect. It's a very fast effect, goes um, many terahertz of bandwidth, but again, suitable for modulators because the, the, the effect is still too weak to really cascade uh, into many devices. The typical materials that have a Pockels effect uh, are um, polymers and uh, perovskite materials like uh, lead zircon and titanate. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you, there have been demonstrations of good modulators, good phase shifters with Pockels effect. Like for instance, if you take a silicon slot waveguide and you fill the slot, the center of the slot with polymers, the light sees these polymers quite strongly. You have a good electric field over the polymers. You can do very efficient modulation. Uh, and the same tricks can be applied with materials like lead zirconate titanate or BTO to make also modulators uh, with, with like more non-organic materials. It's a bit more complicated. Um, the problem is, again, with these phase shifters, most of these uh, materials, the Pockels effect is too weak to really make a very compact phase shifter. Okay, I'm talking about materials that have weak effects. And we clearly want a strong effect. So what are the options there? Well, one type of materials that could be used is, is phase change materials. <laughs> the geometry looks a bit like the Pockels effect material, but phase change materials are situated on the very strong and very slow side of the spectrum. Uh, what are phase change materials? They're essentially materials that consist of multiple quasi-stable uh, states. For instance, a crystalline state and an amorphous state with very different optical properties. So uh, one material, for instance, is, is GST, uh, which uh, has a very, very big difference in its refractive index, but also in its absorption between the amorphous state and the crystalline state. And so the, the, the amorphous state is very, uh, very low loss. The crystalline state is very lossy. And the, this is okay. It's actually with a very short device, 20 microns, you can, have a, you can make a switch using these materials that either absorb light or pass light through. And the way you switch it is by just using a thermal pulse and the shape of that pulse determines whether it's gonna cool down in its amorphous state or cool down in its crystal state. And you can actually do states in between, like fractional states. So you can not just do an on and off switch, but you can do a kind of a gradual switch. The big problem is that most phase change materials like GST have a transparent and a lossy state. What we want for our programmable photonics is a phase shifter, actually two transparent states, but with a very different refractive index. And that has been an elusive goal for quite some years until recently, 
materials like based on antimony, antimony and selenium have been found to have really, really nice properties with two states that are really very different in refractive index, but at the same time, very transparent. And this, is, this, this looks on paper like to be an ideal material to make programmable photonics because you, you need only a short length between 20 and 50 microns to get a good phase shift. And on top of it, you can control it very simply with the thermal pulse and it, it maintains its state. So once, once you've configured it, it's non-volatile, it maintains its state. So this is a very useful property. You can program your chip and it will maintain its state. The problem is that this, these materials are still fairly experimental. You can, most demonstrations show like a few hundred programming cycles rather than the, the thousands or millions pro of programming cycles that you would actually want. But okay, this is, a, this is work in progress. This is a very promising, uh, promising evolution. Um, other, other types of materials that, that can be used actually for, uh, that, that can be used for uh, solid state tuning is for instance, again, the, the barium titanate material that, that we mentioned earlier as a buckles effect, but it also has a, a polycrystalline uh, effect where, the, where you get polling in domains that gives you also on top of the buckles effect, also a non-volatile state. Other materials with very strong electro-optic effects are liquid crystals. We know them from dis displays, from projectors. Um, but you can also put liquid crystals on a silicon photonics chip. Of course, it's a liquid, so it, it takes a bit of thinking. Like you, you, need, you, you need to have the liquid around your waveguide, but then you have to have some electro to keep everything in place. Uh, but then if you do it like this, you can use your waveguide as one electrode or your substrate as one electrode. And you have a top electrode and you can reorient the molecules of the liquid crystal by applying an electric field. And this is a very strong effect because these molecules are extremely anisotropic. So they have a very strong difference whether they're oriented vertically or horizontally and the light will feel that. You need to get it on the chip, of course. So liquids on a chip might not seem like a very attractive proposition, especially in a, in a typical silicon photonics platform, your waveguides are covered by like six, seven microns of material. So you need to open up the material locally and then you need to put liquid crystal in there locally, which for instance, you can do with inkjet printing. Uh, and that gives you, of course, a suddenly a very attractive uh, phase shifter because if you, if you take a geometry like this, where you have a waveguide uh, flanked by a side electrode, applying a voltage between the waveguide and the side electrode would give you a full reorientation of your liquid crystals. And that's, uh, that's, that works very well. And as I said, you can locally inkjet print these liquid crystals inside uh, these cavities locally on the chip. You can see in a polarization microscope, polarized microscope, you can see the liquid crystals actually there because they're very, very anisotropic. And then if you apply a voltage on these liquid crystals, so you have a voltage and an electrode on the liquid crystal, you can get very, very strong uh, electro-optic phase shifts uh, with a 50 micron length. So this shows a 100 micron length with a phase shift of more than 2 uh, pi for 5 volts or most recent results, which are not yet published, uh, more than double this efficiency. So you can have a phase shifter that is that can give you a full 2 pi phase shift swing with less than 50 micron with CMOS compatible drive voltages. But of course, with the added difficulty that you have to manage your liquids on the chip. Other mechanisms that would, would classify as very strong are MEMS devices, movable devices. Why are they very strong? Well, if you move silicon around, you're changing locally the refractive index from one, which is air around surrounding to 3.5, which is silicon. It's about as strong as you can get it. It's the silicon is there or it is not there. So that makes a very interesting idea for doing electro-optic effects. Um, how, would, how would you do that? Well, you would basically use the same type of manufacturing uh, techniques as used for regular MEMS, the ones that you find in your smartphones. You would take a photonic chip and then locally remove the material underneath the waveguide so that the waveguide can now move around. 
And so you have this light propagating through the waveguide here from left to right. And you see that on the side of the waveguide, there's this little blue colored uh, silicon beam, like a silicon suspended beam. Uh, it's suspended by these folded springs, so it can move uh, on this shuttle, which can move uh, laterally from the waveguide by just applying a voltage on this comb drive. So the typical devices here require fairly high voltage, but it's electrostatic actuation. So even though the voltage is high, it doesn't consume any power right away. So we're having these MEMS devices, if you put them in a simulator, you need to simulate the, electro the electrical, optical and mechanical effects all uh, in, in how they interact with one another. We see that we would get a pi phase shift if we would apply 30 volts. In reality, it turns out that, that the device is even more efficient, uh, probably because when you release all these waveguides, there's a bit of strain relief, and actually that helps us. So with a 20 volt actuation, we get a pi phase shift. Now this is without real power consumption. We're talking about nanowatts of power consumption in this device. So this is a very, very interesting device because it can be made with the same techniques as already used for making regular MEMS and for making silicon photonics. You can also do in a MEMS device more than just a phase shifter. You can actually make immediately a tunable coupler in a very, very simple way. I mean, if you, if you have a coupler like this, you come in with light, it would couple if the waveguides are close together. If you wave, pull the waveguides apart, they no longer couple and the light just goes on. And so by just applying an analog voltage, you can control the coupling very accurately. And again, we've made such devices in a European project called Morphic uh, that, uh, that, is now, uh, that has now ended uh, recently, last year. Now, can you use these devices to make programmable photonics? Uh, well, yes. Uh, for instance, th this is an example. You see six of these, uh, two times six of these MEMS devices. So three phase shifters, three tunable couplers, Essentially, they form one of these cores that you see uh, that, that I showed earlier with these different optical gates. Uh, and, and together, they form this hexagonal mesh. It doesn't look like a hexagonal mesh because we, we rotated everything to be all oriented in the same direction. But the connections of the waveguides between all these tunable couplers and phase shifters form a hexagonal mesh, just like the one I showed earlier. Now, this is nice. You have, the, you have all these MEMS devices. Uh, there's, there is a problem with MEMS devices that they are kind of fragile, so you don't want them exposed to the air. Uh, ideally, you want to operate them in something like a, a weak vacuum. So we need some additional processing to protect these by putting a silicon lid on every MEMS device so to, to make sure that it doesn't get influenced by external factors and that it doesn't get damaged. If, for instance, a small package, a particle falls onto it during the packaging process. And so what, what, what we get then is, these are the MEMS devices as they were before. We use the top metal of the, of the silicon photonics to put a hermetic silicon cap onto it. And we, we basically fully protect it. So you have these nice fancy little caps. And because they're local, you can still access your metal bond wires for uh, electrically controlling the MEMS. You can still access your optical ports through the grating couplers. So th this, this is, why am I focusing on these things? Well, these programmable photonic circuits, they're typically quite large. So it's not just one device. It's not just one gate. We want good gates, but we want them also in large numbers. And that means that you need a good process that really scales up well with high yield. All, you want all these gates to work, uh, but you also want to have optical interfaces, electrical interfaces to these gates. You want driving circuits, so you're thinking about total power consumption on your chip. And then on top of that, you want to see what is going on. So you need also access to monitoring like photo detectors on your chip to make sure that you can control every building block correctly. So thinking about materials and efficient phase shifters is one thing. You also have to think at the same time, can we scale this up to really large chips with high quality that, uh, that can be used, uh, that can be really programmed. Because a programmable photonic chip with only one gate is not going to do you a lot of good. So we need to control every device. That means that for every phase shifter and every tunable coupler, we need a digital to analog converter. Uh, 
we need a digital controller as well. So that's a lot of electronics if you're thinking about hundreds or thousands of gates. So, and, and lots of electronics also introduce the question of packaging. You need to interface the electronics with the photonics. On top of that, we want to make sure that every phase shift and tunable coupler is in its correct state. These are analog devices. All, there's going to be small differences between these devices. Um, so you want, you want to not just have a digital to analog converter, you want some way to have a feedback loop, a control loop, which means you need monitor photo detectors, you need, uh, you need control loops uh, to basically control everything that's going on on the chip. And that's not, not that trivial. Okay, you can, we, we know how to make photo detectors on a photonic chip. But where are you going to put them? I mean, you have, your, you have your mesh with all these optical gates. You need some control routines. Somehow you need to drive every element and get, get extract information out. And just figuring out where to extract the information is already a big question. Because let's look, let's look at one, one of these nodes. This corresponds to like one of these MEMS pictures that I showed earlier with three phase shifters and three tunable couplers. You have a flow of light that's bidirectional in such a system. You have power coupling. You have phase delay. You need to if you want to know all everything that's going on, you need basically a detector at all of these green dots. That's a lot of detectors because every detector also needs to be read out. So you need electrical connections for every detector. That's probably overkill. And it's also maybe impossible just because of the scale. So we need to come up with clever ways to say like, okay, we want only a sparse number of detectors, and we, that, but that would still allow us to have full control of everything in, inside this chip, to be able to extract all information, observe everything in the chip, just from a limited number of detectors, to allow us to control everything. And that's just local control loops. On top of that, we need algorithms that allow us to configure functionality in the circuits. Like we need to know how to build ring resonators, how to build filters, how to make connections. So, and, and figuring out where, what would be the shortest connection or the best programming strategy for a, a particular connectivity. So that, that's programming algorithms. And then on top of that, when everything is there, you still need some governing algorithms that make sure that everything is running. So the control loop, the, the, the whole control architecture is, a, is, a, is something that needs to be fully developed before such a processor really becomes useful. And this is not there yet. So the, this is the, the first demonstrations of these chips are there, but such an entire full stack of algorithms and control that really puts it in the hand of a user is not, is, is that not yet there or at a very, very rudimentary stage. Now, another challenge that I, I already brought up is that that just comes again with the numbers of devices that we have on a chip like this is the packaging. I mean, we, we need on the order of a thousand electrical connections for such a chip and we need optical interfaces. And of course, the electronics needs to be there as well. So you can think about putting the electronics and photonics in the same chip. And while this is probably the good long term solution, in the short term, this is a very expensive and very difficult to design pro problem. Products might be using flip chip stacking, very interesting concept, very efficient, very good density of integration. But you would need a custom electronics chip to make this possible, which is also again very costly, especially if your photonics is still under development. It's going to be risky to also design the electronics together. So today, most approaches use packaging based approaches like wire bonding to connect the photonics and the electronics. But that's kind of tricky to get it done on a scale that we really want to. Because the scale that we're talking about, as I showed earlier, we have, we have this three phase shifts and three, three couplers. It scales up to really large circuits. And actually, this is only showing a part of the circuit. The circuit that we're talking about here has over 700 actuators and 200 photo detectors. So it's a very large one of these programmable meshes. So again, in this, this project Morphic that I talked about, we came up with uh, a, an approach uh, developed by Tyndall, where we have a very large chip with a regular grid of wires, uh, of bond pads, sorry, where we can do electrical connections. 
So we can actually, if we really want to do up to 3,300 connections, and then for this grid, a regular grid, which is a, a reusable pattern, uh, an interposer was designed that coupled all of these 3,300 bond paths to the outside world with a pitch that is compatible with printed circuit boards. So it's, it's, not, it's not a packaging solution that allows you to really immediately make a, a, an efficient product, but it's a packaging solution that allows you to do rapid prototyping of really, really complex photonic chips. And this is what we need, because we need to shorten that runway again. We need to reduce the number of iterations. And this is one technology that could help a lot with that. Just to, some pictures. So the, the interposer has like 3,300 DC connectors. It also has interfaces for high-speed input and output channels. It has a very dense pitch on one side, but on the other side, it has a pitch of, 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 of a millimeter. So you can directly put such an interposer on a regular printed circuit board. And this is a very useful uh, step. Of course, the whole packaging process takes some time. So you, if you start from a silicon chip, you need some gold stud bumping, solder jetting, uh, eventually flip chipping the silicon chip on the interposer, then, and then putting the interposer on either directly soldering or through uh, spring connectors, connecting the interposer to the outside world uh, on a printed circuit board. So that's, that's another set of solder balls and then uh, flip chipping the interposer onto the printed circuit board and connecting the printed circuit board to the outside world. And the nice thing is that once we have these connectors to the outside world, in this project, we also developed the driver mechanics or the driver uh, technology for these printed circuit boards. So this is an example of the printed circuit board that would be needed for that very large chip, so the, the, the thousand connections that we needed. And on and this circuit board then connects to a number of modular driver boards. This is all a modular approach. Eventually, you can imagine that if you would make programmable chips like that, you would bring everything together in a much more compact package. But the compact packages are also take, uh, and, and the compact driver electronics also take a lot of time to develop. So what we've been building here is not just the programmable photonic chips, but also the infrastructure around it for developers to do rapid prototyping of complex systems. Um, and this, this, is, this is essential. Otherwise, photonics is not going to break through at a large scale, just like electronics did. These are all things that were developed for electronics years ago. For photonics, it's still a very new concept. Okay, I mentioned the driver electronics. The driver electronics are just one thing. Eventually, you also need software layers. So, what we did is interface this driver electronics with our chip design software, with our circuit simulator, and we added layers to actually add configurations for these meshes so that we now can, from software, control these programmable electronic chips. So this gives you an entirely new way of playing with photonics. Instead of designing a chip as a layout, a geometry design, or designing a chip as a circuit, you can now take such a chip it's already there, but you implement your functionality as a program. So not as a circuit, not as a layout, but as a program for an existing chip. And of course, you can do that manually, but you can also think about automated mechanisms to do this programming for you, just like you have synthesis for FPGAs based on VHDL. And one technique that we, 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 we developed is basically mapping this layout of the circuit into a graph representation that allows us to do uh, to, to use a lot of these automated graph routines for routing like solving the traveling salesman problem but use it directly on this kind of circuit uh, to do automated routing it, it's a bit complicated more complicated than the graph at the top in the end we ended up with a graph like this where each gate is represented by eight nodes and it has to be a directed graph because we uh, a, a light can not just change direction, so the flow of light always goes in one direction. But once we had this graph representation, we could then adapt existing algorithms, for instance, for network routing, to do multi-routing in this uh, in, in this this waveguide mesh, uh, including collision avoidance and path balancing. Uh, we could also do distribution trees with different constraints.
like using the minimum number of components or minimizing the optical power in each waveguide. Uh, we, we, could, we could basically do a, a, a snake-like tap-based uh, splitting tree or a full tree splitting as quickly as possible. Now, all these, even if you get configurations from this, and this works rather well, it's quite efficient uh, programming technique, you have to still keep in mind that everything we're doing in such a mesh and everything that's going on is an analog process. So all these devices, these tunable couplers, these MEMS couplers, or these heater-based uh, gates, they're all analog devices. So that means that even though you design something perfect, you will always get errors, both in the phase shift and in the coupling. So as a result, your state of your gates is not going to be exactly the state that you want. So you will get, as a result, you will get the perfect state, but on top of that, you will get small errors and in a, in a recirculating mesh like this, this will give rise to like small ring resonators, very weak resonators that can completely mess up the performance of your device. And just, just to give you an idea of how bad this actually is, I mean, if, if, you, if you just route the light from left to right and you add a 1% random variation, so just the couplers are different with 1%, you see all these ugly peaks starting to pop up. And that's, that's like 20% of your power that is ending up in places where it doesn't have to be. And at the same time, you have a very strong wavelength dependence, which you don't want. If you have a 3% variation, you'll see that in some cases you lose half of the power. That's totally unacceptable. So you need ways to come up with that programming techniques to cleverly configure your mesh in such a way that you're not suffering too much from these effects. And for instance, a very straightforward way to do it is to switch to, to set all the couplers that you're not using into a cross state, because then all these loops are as much as possible uh, killed by just routing the light to the edges of the mesh. So you still have loss. You still have additional losses up to 20%, but at least these annoying uh, spikes have disappeared your resonances are your wavelength dependence is at least a bit under control. But okay, th th this has to be part of your software architecture to basically make this work. So that means that programmable photonics, it's not just about photonics. It's not just about making efficient phase shifters. <coughs> it's about making, um, it's about making uh, the photonics, it's about making the drivers, it's digital electronics for control, and you need software layers on top to make everything work. So, if we combine these together, photonics, electronics, everything, you might end up with something that looks a bit like this. Kind of a Raspberry Pi scale package or something like that, which contains photonics, electronics, also, the electronic, the high-speed electronic drivers, amplifiers, high-speed connectors, a fiber ray out, a light source attached to it, <coughs> and maybe an FPGA to, to, to control everything. And then, connected to that, you would have your software layers, which are your feedback loops, your configuration algorithms, but also development and debug tools for users that they can visualize what is going on to, with the chip. Just like with an FPGA, you have tools that you, every, every FPGA vendor provides you with tools that help you design and program your FPGA. Well, for programmable photonics needs the same thing to be really useful. It needs to be go beyond the demonstration in the lab or a demonstration uh, on a trade show. You need that full stack working together. And we're getting there. I mean, there's progress in the world, and I'll show you an example a bit later, where we're building this entire technology stack going all the way from the programming, programmable photonic chip all the way to the program algorithms and the developer kits needed for users to get that working. So eventually we'll end up with something that a general programmable photonic chip where you can do in software routing of your light, switching, distribution, you can do filtering and basically construct
any optical function you like. Now what can you what would you be able to do that? What would be the impact of this? Well, let's take our example that I started off like an hour ago with we wanted to build a transceiver. Well, in a programmable photonic chip, if you just wanted to test your transceiver, you could prototype it by connecting the laser to four modulators and then the modulators to an output and then have your input fibers connect, wire it to the photodetectors. It's going to be a bit more lossy than a dedicated chip, but you can already try and test the system. You can see whether this makes sense in your environment, in your application case. And if you wanted to change to coherent communication, yeah, okay, you can take the same laser, but now route it to your modulators in a different way with a balanced path, turn it into an IQ modulator, and send the output to the fiber. And the same way your input fiber could be coupled to the, the balanced photodetectors, and you can use tap of a little bit of your laser as a local oscillator to make a coherent detector. And that's just by reprogramming. You don't need to do anything else. And the same way you can use this mesh to bring in more than one laser and use the mesh to make ring resonator based filters to do the muxing and demultiplexing of the, of the waveguides. So you can make a wave and division multiplexing transceiver. And the same filter bank can be done for at the, at the receiver side. So separate the four wavelengths coming in from the fiber and you send them all to a separate detector. It just would require reprogramming. Can you imagine the time saving that this would take for just checking out which architecture fits best into your system? Well, in electronics, that would have been relatively easy. In photonics, this is not yet there. It's coming. It's not yet there. You, but you can also use it for different application cases. And now it becomes interesting because you can just as well do different things than transceivers. You can make a switch by just rerouting your light through different paths. And with the right algorithms, you can even make sure that all the paths have the same length. So that the loss of your switch is always the same. You could use the filtering capabilities to make ring resonators to separate your light into different wavelength channels to make a spectrometer. And you can combine rings and, and, and magzenders to make even more complicated filters. But probably one of the most intriguing applications would be to go to microwave photonics, where you use the microwave input and output capabilities to perform optic, optical filtering process uh, or microwave filtering processes in the optical domain. So you come in with a laser, you modulate a microwave signal onto your optical carrier, and now you can send it. And if you tap off a little bit through the local oscillator, you can get your microwave signal back out at the photodetector. But now you can, in one of the paths, you can now add filter components. You can do, for instance, double ring-loaded Maxander interferometer, which will adjust your microwave signal. For instance, you can do rebalancing or, re -equal or equalizing to make sure that the signal comes out with a better quality. So if we think about applications where this photonics can be used, there's, there's a lot of those. I mean, okay, you can think about the obvious ones like data centers, where you can prototype new top of rack switches. Probably once you're happy with the idea, you will still make an ASIC chip for that, but you can prototype new concepts, like for instance, uh, concepts based on, on circuit switching instead of packet switching. Uh, you, you might be able to try new transceiver protocols because the protocol can essentially be programmed in the photonic chip to maybe get a bit more bandwidth out of your fibers or a lower power consumption out of your fibers. You can stay in the communication range, like think about fiber to the home. Having a flexible, remotely programmable hub in a building that can govern all the fiber connections inside the house or inside the building is very useful. It can even do micro, some microwave legacy connections for XDSL subscribers, for instance. And it's definitely going to be more important to have such an architecture when we're starting to see deployment of like really dense Pico, uh, Pico cells for 5G and 6G, where you have like hundreds of those spread out over a building, which all will need a fiber connection to connect them to the central, uh, to the central hub. So having programmable chips in there that can govern this and which can be upgraded remotely 
or by a technician just flashing a new piece of firmware is a very, very interesting proposition. Now we can think about sensors. Almost all construction projects today, are major construction projects, are getting fiber sensors built in into the construction. Think about windmills, think about ships, think about bridges, think about wings of aircraft, think about skyscrapers. They all have more and more fiber sensors directly built in. But each fiber sensor needs a readout. And these readout systems today are quite bulky. If you can do that on a chip, you can do that and, and you can prototype these or you can even implement these and sell these based on programmable photonics. These sensor readouts can, have, can be flexible in how many channels they can handle. The algorithms to, to read out a fiber sensor can change for different types of fiber sensors. You have a, an upgradable programmable device. And that's just in buildings. You can think about cars the same way. Cars get more and more sensors. And having, an optical having the sensors optically connected to the outside world is a very, uh, very interesting proposition because optical connections are li more lightweight and they are uh, immune to electromagnetic interference. So you can have sensor readouts in a car and you could even think about programmable photonic chips uh, helping you to prototype a, a, a LiDAR, uh, LiDAR engines or even microwave radar engines. And of course, when we talk about photonic sensors, probably one of the most uh, intriguing applications and compelling applications is in the biomedical world, where we think about optical coherence tomography or, tomography or even biosensors. The programmable photonics is probably not going to work well as a biosensor as such, especially not if it's a dis it has to be disposable, but it could be the readout engine for new type of assays. And again, because it's programmable, it becomes easy to optimize, let's say, the wavelength scanning algorithm or the filtering algorithms to maximize the signal from a, from a sensor. So the programmability here makes it really, really interesting. Security applications is another one. I mentioned already the optical hashing and blockchain it could be a, a much more power efficient way to do optical uh, to do hashing and blockchains than what you typically have with digital electronics. And of course, you can think about quantum applications such as quantum key distribution, where optical programmable functions are, of course, also very very valuable. So, does this give us? A chip, a single chip that can do everything? Well, if we manage to make it, yes. It would be able to combine microwave and optical functions. It would be flexible, off the shelf. Uh, if you make it in large enough volumes, it would be cheap. But at the same time, you can argue against it. A large, it, it, It's going to be always larger than a dedicated chip. So large chips are expensive. Light will have to travel to many more building blocks on your photonic chip, so it's going to have a higher loss. And it's obviously going to have a higher power consumption. So there's trade-offs there. But it doesn't take away the value proposition. And the nice thing is that today, it's now become possible to actually test that value proposition. So the Spanish startup company Ipronix, uh, they've, since this year, released this device, uh, the smart light processor. It's a big box. You can hardly call it like a Raspberry Pi at this point, but it's the first demonstration of a generic programmable photonic chip. This is a milestone. It's a tool that you can buy where you can already start prototyping optical functions on a chip. So it, it's expensive. It's a first prototype but it's paving the way and it shows people that this is a really, really interesting model for working with photonics. It has, of course, not just the hardware, it has a software interface. You can visualize the flow of light through your system. You can read out what, what, what the transmission is. Uh, you can construct filter functions. You can do routing functions, etc. So it's, it, 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 puts, it puts this in the hands of developers today to start experimenting with this kind of functionality. Now, there's a few things that we have to think about, and that's cost. Does this really make sense from a cost point of view? 
We think yes. Now, if you if you want to build a photonic chip today, a custom chip, yeah, you typically need to design a chip and have it fabricated, not just the photonics, but also the electronics. And then you have to bring them together and eventually the whole mask set and cost of fabrication of the wafer scale production and all the costs that come after for the packaging and assembly and testing all falls onto your shoulders. That's a very, very expensive route. And so, of course, I also mentioned the time that it takes to do this. Now, imagine having a programmable photonic chip, generic, which is provided by it's been designed by someone, it's a chipset supplier, it provides you the photonic chips and the electronic chips as a, a package, a program, a programmable photonic combination. Now at that time, you can imagine that such a supplier is not going to be limited to one customer. So multiple customers will be sharing all the development costs of that programmable photonic chip. And where are those costs? What are those costs? Well, if you look at the you have the chips, of course, the, the electronics and the, the, the photonics. There's a large re non-recurrent engineering cost to make these. As we showed earlier, you have to design the chip, wafer scale fabrication and testing. And these are really complex chips. So indeed, you might actually end up having to do multiple iterations as a developer to make these chips work. And then on top of that, of course, you have all the more proportional costs of making a package like this, which are more related to packaging like the optical fibers and inter interfaces, the electrical interfaces, uh, and, and of course the assembly of everything, putting everything together. That's more like on a per piece cost. Now let's run this cost model through three scenarios. Let's take a very cheap photonic chip, no microwave functions, just passive with eight fiber ports, then a mid-range chip which has some microwave functions, and then let's say a, an extreme case where we have like 32 fiber attach uh, and, and 16 high speed inputs and outputs. So we, we can we can do some calculations. The in the end it boils down to if you if you just make a dedicated chip, the total cost is all for you. So you have a non-recurrent engineering cost, and then you have a cost per chip that you fabricate. And the cost per chip uh, can be calculated. And if we if we plot this as a function of the volume, so that's basically your size of your market then we see indeed, as we would expect, that for a very small volume, we get a very high cost per chip. But as we, as we can sell more chips, the cost per chip goes down dramatically. And of course, what we expect is that the cheap or the simple chip is much cheaper by an order of magnitude than the complex chip with many inputs and outputs. Okay, now let's take the same set or the same problem set for a programmable photonic chip. Now, here you have your number of chips uh, is only part or the, the chips that you want which is the order that you're placing is just a fraction of the total number of chips that's been fabricated so the cost of your order is uh, is fractional or the fixed cost is fractional compared to the total cost for actually making those chips so there's a reduction there of course your supplier needs a profit margin let's say 30 percent uh, so you have to add a bit of cost there as well. But if we now plot for small numbers of chips, we see that because these programmable chips by the supplier are made in larger volumes, if you only place a small order, your programmable chips are, can, can be cheaper. Okay, on first, on first instance, you think they look more expensive. Indeed, the curve the dotted curve of the programmable chips is above the solid curve of the application specific chip. But here we didn't take into account that the vendor is actually make makes much, much larger numbers of these chips while you are in the small numbers. So you're actually paying for the costs per chip far on the right of this graph while you yourself only need a as much smaller number. So for prototyping small volumes, going to programmable chips can be much, much cheaper because you can benefit from the volume of a generic chip, chip supplier. And then of course, that, on, that, only gives you, that, that not only gives you a cost advantage, it also gives you a time, a time advantage because now you're basically taking the whole block in the middle of chip design and wafer scale fabrication out 
and you can buy a chip and immediately start testing. And as, as, as the, the quicker you can get a test of your concept with a potential customer, the less risk you have as an entrepreneur, as an innovator. And so a programmable chip can easily shorten that runway with a year. And if you think that you need multiple iterations, it can shorten that with multiple years. So this loop, taking out this loop and only putting it in at the point where you really know that your chip design is valid and is going to be useful for a customer is a very, very big uh, difference. So that brings me almost to the end of my talk here and we I, I see we have some time for questions left what would be the benefits so the main benefits of having a general purpose programmable photonic chip uh, in your hands well as I showed you lower development cost and shorter time to market but there's more a number of really very interesting indirect benefits the second the first advantage is that if you base a product on something that's programmable and smart that brings me back to the very first slides in my deck here. It also brings about that the fact that you can do over-the-air upgrades or that you can repurpose devices for different purposes. You can add functionality. And because programmable chips typically also contain more building blocks than you actually need, you could, if, if one building block fails, you could reroute the light to a building block that actually works. So you could have redundancy built in and therefore a longer lifetime of your building block. But probably the biggest advantage that programmable photonics could bring is the fact that it's programmable. It has a software interface. Today, photonics, the whole photonics world community is really facing a massive shortage of skilled people, people who know really the ins and outs of photonics in lots of detail. Now, if you can make abstractions of, uh, of, the, of the, the, the chip hardware itself through a software interface and electronics, you suddenly have a much larger community of people who can innovate, people who just want to use the software layers, people who just know the electronics. That's a factor of 100 to 1,000 more people that now get access to the innovation potential of photonics. And this is, this is I think, non-negligible. Have, we have seen the same thing with electronics in the maker community. By having tools like Arduinos with good developer interfaces, suddenly we've seen an explosion of Internet of Things, of smart devices, by small companies with just clever ideas using mostly off-the-shelf hardware to really innovate. And this is where photonics needs to go. We need that. We need that innovation because we need eventually to provide fabs with a volume that is economically viable. Otherwise, the fabs will give up at some point if they don't get enough chips run through their process. So photonics has this potential to be useful for many applications. And we need to shorten that runway. And that, this is what this is what programmable, this is the whole message of programmable photonics, the potential of programming photonics, the promise of programmable photonics. It's the acceleration of prototyping for new applications. It will enable new things by itself, but just accelerating innovation itself can be a complete game changer. And because with new, with new applications, you will get higher production volumes and larger user communities, it will accelerate the whole photonic ecosystem. Now, that being said, I mean, as you probably noticed, a lot of my slides were not real things, but were PowerPoints, PowerPoint pictures. We're not yet there. Yes, there is the Ipronix first processor. Great. The big milestone. But we need more. We, we, we need the reality of that full ecosystem fully materializing, not just with the hardware and the software, but also with the people that know how to program these devices the part of taking programmable photonics into the ecosystem. And we need better hardware. We need better electro-optic phase shifters. We need better photonic electronic integration. We need better control routines. We need better programming routines. All of that is still at the very, very beginning. And if you look at the world of FPGAs today, there is still enormous amount of innovation going on into making FPGAs, electronic FPGAs better. After 30 years, more than 30 years, 
we know what is ahead of us with photonics. A lot of work, a lot of interesting work. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. I would also like to thank all the people who directly or indirectly contributed to the material of this, this slide deck, also the funding agencies that supported our work. And if there are any questions, I think we have quite a bit of time to answer questions. Thank you. In the meantime, I can check if there are questions in the chat. I think everyone, it is possible to unmute yourself, but you can also post questions in the chat if you want. Yes, I can hear you, but it's 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 a bit faint, and there's a lot of feedback on the on the audio. In the meantime, maybe I can make a question to me. Sure. If it's okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation and uh, the overview. Uh, my question is rather technical, and it's, uh, I don't know if we have uh, time to you have the time to extend on this, but I would like to ask uh, about the heart of the of the process that is done in these uh, optical circuits. I understand that you can have linear combinations of the optical field at the output. Is that right? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, so if we want to go from uh, to, to, pho to photo detection, we have to, to eventually process power. So yes. uh, don't we take mixed terms in the power at the output? So we do not have this linear combination of the optical fields anymore because of the cross terms? Uh, indeed, what you what your if you if you would put a photo detector at any of these outputs, so the the, the, the control the, what you control is this is the the complex amplitudes between inputs and outputs. So what you get indeed is control of the field, but what you measure if you just put a photo detector there is the square of the of, of the field. The, so the amplitude. Um, however, there are ways to measure fields. For instance, if you at the detector, if you use a balanced detector with what, what we call either, uh, well, if you mix your field that's coming out with a local oscillator uh, at your detector and you use a balanced detector, you actually get the, get the mixing term, which gives, you the, the, which gives you a photo current that is now proportional to your field, not to your, uh, not, not to your uh, power. And and this is this is the technique you, this is used in coherent detection. So all coherent transceivers use this technique to encode not just amplitude but also phase information. Okay, okay. So we need a balanced detection again. Yes, okay. but but okay, that that that's relatively easy to do. So let me let me take one of these other examples, um, where I actually showed an example like this. So if we have if we take our microwave photonics example, and I'll put myself out of the picture for a minute. Um, so you see, you see the, the light, what, what we have is the light is encoded onto the optical field. Let me just, so the light, is the light is encoded here on the optical field. So that's your input signal. But you see that at the same time, you get a local oscillator here. And so you're your filtered field, which goes through the bottom path, interferes here, is combined with the local oscillator into, and okay, this is a balanced detector, so it's two detectors, and what you get out is again the field. So this is one way where you can not just detect, but also uh, process 
not just the amplitude of the light, but also the phase. Okay, so was there now a question? Okay, so there was the question from. Well, there's, there's quite some questions now. Just give me a second. Let's go through them one by one. Okay, what do you, there was a question from what do you think about using meta surfaces to build a Max Zender interferometer? Um, well, with, with, I think most most techniques using meta surfaces would be free space techniques. That would, I mean, meta surfaces could definitely play an interesting role in a kind of programmable or at least uh, yeah programmable systems that I described here, where you have where you basically want to couple pixels together, and indeed that could be done in an interferometric way. You could use a meta surface to split and then combine light again. Um, on, on a chip itself, like in a circuit, the way we described in the second half of my presentation, I don't really see meta surfaces as a very uh, useful uh, tool. But okay, I might be wrong. Uh, there might be some very interesting opportunities there. Okay, I see that the next question is, how can these programmable photonics be used for sensing applications, like when we need to introduce chemical biological material in the optical path? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, my first assessment uh, would be that you would not use the programmable photonics as part of the sensing scheme itself, but you would use it as the readout mechanism. For instance, you, you, you might have a substrate with biomolecules where you're measuring. You, your, your programmable chip sends light into, those, into that substrate and then takes the light back again from the substrate. Uh, like could be a substrate with ring resonators, and it does the processing for you. So, for instance, it it, it, it takes a spectrum, or it controls the wavelength of the light that's being that's uh, like the laser that is being sent through. So, but I don't see immediately a good case where you would start to functionalize uh, these programmable photonic circuits for sensors themselves, because in that case, yeah, you typically need something very custom for every type of thing that you want to sense. And that would defeat the purpose of having a general programming for pro programmable photonic circuits. OK, then the next question is, so the REC versus the Clement versus the Diamond or some other mesh topology, which one would be best for a quantum deep neural network classifier application? OK, so we're talking about this kind of uh, different mesh topologies that I showed earlier. Just a second. Let's put the right slide on. Then everyone is at least on the same page. So these are just two examples mentioned in the question. So this is the Clements mesh. This is the REC mesh. Um, both are actually, I think, equivalent if it comes to neural network applications. Um, I'm not an expert on quantum deep neural networks. I think if, if you want to learn more about that, uh, I think you have to look for the, the work of Professor Dirk Englund and his team from MIT. Um, but so for, for if you just want to program a deep neural network, I think both would probably work. Except that the, the, this one, the, the, the Miller rec mesh, might be easier to train than the, the Clements mesh. So if, you, if you're using backpropagation training, there's been a paper out recently where they demonstrated backpropagation training in such a mesh would be much harder to do in this type of mesh. Um, if you really want to go to recurrent neural networks, then you would probably need one of these recirculating meshes to make that work. Because then you, then you can circulate your light in the mesh. You have a kind of optical memory inside your system. OK, there's a, the next question is, these mechanical gates and switches seem to be a bottleneck in the processing speed of the chip. Could manipulation by means of light, or even UV light, and constructive destructive interference of light be used instead? Uh, that's an interesting proposition. So, yeah, we, we, ha we have all these mechanisms, and indeed, uh, most of them are 
most of the ones that are strong enough are too slow. Now, one of the reasons, uh, well, well the, the, the next question is, can you do this with light? Uh, there's some interesting thoughts. One of the problems with fast optical processing or fast, light is, is not very good at non-linearities. I mean, okay, you can do non-linear optics, but it's actually, it's actually a, a pretty weak effect compared to most electro-optic effects, uh, especially if you want to do it very fast, then the, the non-linear optical effects that are at the same time fast are typically also quite weak. So you would need to engineer quite good of local optimal confinement to make that work. Now what could work is if you have photosensitive materials, uh, those are slow effects, you're basically changing the structure of the material with light, you still need quite a, a high intensity of, of, of optical power, but the effect can be very strong. Like for instance, changing the composition of polymers, or there's been a very nice uh, demonstration of changing the porosity of polymers, like making a, 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 a polymer layer quite porous with lots of air vac vacancies or making it quite dense, uh, using light as a way to control the porosity. So that I think would be, a, would be a very, very interesting way, but it's a slow mechanism. It's not a fast mechanism. Um, it's, I think, an inherent problem that all the fast mechanisms are at the same time rather weak. And I don't think there's been already a, a workaround that, that really gets you to like more than, more than gigahertz bandwidth with a very strong effect. Okay, then there's the question, what if I think about a different platform for building an MZI instead of CMOS? Uh, use cellulose nanofibers. So you want to build an MZI out of cellulose nanofibers. I'm okay, I'm don't want to say anything bad about this because I don't know anything about it. Um, in any case, I think the rule is, is, is quite commonly valid. The moment you want to make custom materials uh, or custom chips, you're going to end up in that long iteration cycle. So if I think one of the key benefits of programmable photonics is going to be the fact that you're dramatically shortening your iteration cycles. But at the same time, that means you're limited to what those programmable platforms can do. If that platform has been made for wavelengths of 15, 50 nanometer, but you want to prototype something in the visible, it, yeah, okay, then that's not going to work. So the moment you want to do something custom, you're automatically putting yourself in the, in the situation that you have to go through slow iterations. And okay, ideally what we will see in the, in the future is not just one programmable chip emerging, but a family of programmable chips for different subsets, like for instance, for visible light or for, uh, for high speed applications. Just like today, you have families of FPGAs. There's not one FPGA that does everything. There's families of FPGAs that, that do different things better than others. But we'll need, that, we'll need those tools. And indeed, as people are looking for more diverse applications, we will probably see programmable photonics appear for different applications. I see a hand raised by Honor Tuskol, if I pronounce that correctly. Yes. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much for this nice presentation. I have a very um, simple question. I saw in your uh, this hexagonal uh, mesh, I saw that uh, we only have uh, passive uh, uh, components that like the white lights and uh, MMIs and phase shifters. Um, and I know that it is made in silicon photonics, but when it comes to amplification, if you need to use an amplifier, for instance, you can create a ring laser. I know that there are integration, yes, uh, in the post integration models, but do you see that this is going to happen something in the future, or is there already some work on this? There, there has been some work on it, but it, that, that, there's, a, there's a couple of challenges, of course. There's, there's quite a lot of work going on, different techniques to integrate amplifiers and lasers on silicon photonics. 
or in parallel you have these platforms like 3.5 semiconductors, indium phosphide that have amplifiers built in. You can, so that we hope or, or, or the, the idea is if, you, if we make programmable photonics that eventually we can also use these technologies to add amplifiers. Now the second question is then where to put these amplifiers? It's a relatively easy thing to put the amplifiers on the edge of your mesh just like we put the modulators and the detectors and the fiber interfaces on the edge of our mesh. That is, that is something that we actually already have prototypes. Uh, so that is the more difficult thing becomes when you want to put these amplifiers inside your mesh. Because then you are looking at all these requirements uh, that we had like for, for, optical, for optical gates. The amplifiers would basically take the space of an optical gate so we want those amplifiers also to have a quite small footprint and a short optical length, which usually they don't. They, they, they're typically quite large and they have a quite long optical length. And on top of that, amplifiers generate a lot of heat. So if you put amplifiers really like in the core of your mesh, you need to be very, very careful about things like thermal crosstalk, uh, because even if you're not using heaters to control your mesh, your devices still remain temperature sensitive. So amplifiers inside your mesh, even though you could do really think about super interesting applications like topological lasers or ring lasers uh, that you could enable with this technique, the, the amplifier might cause you more trouble than gain, uh, uh, not optical gain, but like functional gain. So I have a question, I have personal doubts about uh, how soon we will see amplifiers that really are su take sufficient number of boxes here or are good enough that we can afford to put them in the center of the mesh. Uh, thank you very much for the answer. I have one very short question. Is there a specific reason why you, these modulators are able to, uh, at the edge of the circuit? Because they're big. I see. Okay. They're, they're typically one, two millimeters long. And there's a second reason, they need to interface to microwave strip lines and maybe microwave amplifiers. You want to keep those interfaces as short as possible to prevent crosstalk and to, to, to make sure you have the maximum bandwidth and the lowest microwave RF loss. Thank you. Okay, let's see, there's a few more questions here. Um, what do you think about having an extra mesh in our programmable chip, which uh, we can go to when we want to perform active operations uh, and therefore integrate uh, lithium niobate or tree five or build SOAs or even lasers? Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a bit in line with the previous question. Um, the, the, the problem is if you really want to put such things in a mesh, uh, you're, you're bound to these constraints or at least you try to tick as many of these boxes as possible. And, and quite a few of these devices, these special functions, uh, they're, they're not really compatible with this. Especially the thermal crosstalk can be a big problem. Um, so putting them on the, the periphery of your existing mesh is probably the short-term solution that everyone will use. But yeah, you can, you, you can think about like having an extra switch box to your modulators so that you can combine modulators in a more clever way uh, or, or directly wire up a modulator with a, a silicon on, uh, or a semiconductor optical amplifier or a laser. Um, but then, yeah, that will always become a bit more customized. So the, the best architectures like mesh architecture or, sep or separations or partitioning of these optical chips it's not really known yet. There's not been a lot of research. So I, I gave you the example of, well, the, the group that probably did most work on all of these things is, is the, the group of Jose Capmani at Valencia together with Ipronix, their startup company. Uh, but even then their basic, the, the chip that they now released after many, many iterations of prototypes is still a very basic architecture. It's a mesh a simple mesh with, with a hexagonal topology uh, with all the functional things sitting on the edge. And okay, there, there, might, there might be 
there's a lot of open space for research to do, go to different mesh architectures, separating the mesh into multiple parts. That is at this point, and then indeed how to integrate active devices in the mesh. That is, as far as I know, totally unexplored. So there's, yeah, fun, fun stuff to do if you want to do research on this. <laughs> it's a wide open field. Okay, there's a question here. What is the desirable area footprint for the 2x2 two two gate to be inserted in a programmable photonic chip? Okay, just to give you an example to go... You see this particular MEMS device, this is about the rectangle surrounding it is about 100 micron by 60 micron. That's its bounding box. This is only a phase shifter. Ideally, we'd like to fit a gate in this. So as a kind of a footprint, this would also correspond to an optical length that, uh, now I have to calculate, an optical length of a few hundred micrometer, which is very good for microwave processing because then that means that you can make meshes with a free spectral range of about 100 gigahertz. And 100 gigahertz is, is where a lot of microwave-based applications are, 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 are situated, so between 0 and 100 gigahertz. So being able to fit it in a box like this, a full gate in a box like this, would be, would be kind of a, a good target. But of course, if you can make it even smaller, be my guest, I'd be very happy to use that gate. And then the last question in the chat I see here is, Apart from a smaller footprint, would micro ring resonators have an advantage over MZIs for implementing the unitary transformations in a photonic neural network? Um, well, micro rings, MZ, MZIs, MZIs basically are a feed forward architecture. They don't have memory. So if you want to make a photonic neural network just for matrix vector multiplication, it basically light propagates from left to right. There's no memory, it's instantaneous processing. A ring is recirculating, a ring has memory. So indeed a ring can be much more compact, it can, because of, of its resonance, it can also amplify certain effects, uh, so make it stronger. But at the same time, you get with lots of complications because rings can add some nonlinearity. Uh, rings, uh, rings are very wavelength dependent, so depending on the input light, wavelength, you might have problems with, with, with your rings. Rings are very dispersive. Um, so I'm not convinced that for the, the, the basic forward propagating neural networks that you would uh, want to use rings uh, directly. Although there have been demonstrations, and I don't have a slide on that in my deck, uh, which I, I left outside of the scope of this, of this talk, uh, that's a kind of matrix vector multiplication trick uh, that does not use the complex amplitude of the light, but rather is based on the, the power of light. And that, that, can, be be, uh, that can be used on, with, with rings. And there's some very nice uh, demonstrations, but I'm thinking which group it is. Okay, I don't know by heart. Uh, that uses this kind of architecture. Okay, so uh, if there's no more questions, I'm not sure if uh, the organizers from Photon Hub Europe want to say a few words or otherwise we can, uh, we can close this presentation.